And so this dude says to me, he flew from Indiana to come to Maine to this show. And we're in the hotel after the show. And it, I'm outside the elevator and he goes, suppose, I got to ask you a question. He goes, what do you do when you've knocked on all the wood and it's still not enough? Essentially, he's saying like, and you want to die. And I was like, I'm going to be honest, man. I'm just like a person and I'm having a really hard time right now too. And I don't know. I wish I had the answer for you, man. I wish I did. I was like, sometimes I can't see, I can't knock on the wood and I can't see the, the positive. And right now is one of those moments, man. And I'm like, super sorry. And he was like, it's crazy that you just said that. Welcome to the Mike Squires and Friends podcast. I'm your host, Mike Squires. Today, I'm joined by the king of Maine himself, Spizzy Spoes. So today, Spoes and I talk about how he got his record deal and what that deal looked like. We talk about his iconic hit, I'm Awesome, and the many ways that this record changed his life. Spoes and I also talk about some of the key factors to maintaining his music career. And we get a little personal and talk about why it's important to be your authentic self. Now you can support the Mike Squires and Friends podcast by hitting that subscribe button, downloading on your preferred podcast platform, or leaving a little rating. But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Mike Squires and Friends. Expose my guy. How you living, dude? Still alive, man. How are you? I'm good, dude. What's the King of Maine been up to? Oh, man. Uh, that's a loaded question. Um... Uh, all sorts of stuff. I've been, uh, kind of balls deep in a lot of different, um, ventures. I've been finishing an album, my 10th album, which I didn't even know if I was going to make a 10th album, but now it's pretty much done. So I am, um, I've been, uh, working on launching a little marijuana business. Very nice. I don't like calling it cannabis. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because like before it was legal and we were just buying it in bags from our friends, nobody was like. I'd like an eighth of cannabis. <laughs> That's so true. I'm trying to be, I really want I really want our brand to say like, we sell weed mm. as like our slogan. <laughs> Anyways, I've been doing that and I've been painting and raising kids and going through life, man. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful thing, dude. You want to talk about the paintings a little bit? Sure. Yeah. What do you want to know? I want to know how it's been because, you know, I've known you when I met you, I knew you as a rapper, an artist, and now you've made this relatively recent transition mm -hmm. into painting. So how's that been? Yeah, it's been fun, to be honest. It was, well, because I think, you know, you've known me throughout my music career, which is a lot, it's serious shit because it's like it has to pay the bills. And so painting, I, I started learning in January 2022, like the first day of the year. I was like, I'm going to teach myself to paint. And I went on YouTube and I watched a bunch of painters I know and how they paint. And, uh, and so I started painting January 2022 and by like March after like doing it kind of nine to five for a few months, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm all right. Um, and so I've really enjoyed doing it and I really haven't sold much of them. I sold the first nine I did that just were my album covers and they were shitty cause they're my first nine paintings. But, um, you know, the reception to my painting overall has been like really nice, but I will say I enjoy it myself without even presenting it to anybody. Like I, I have little, little shit I like about, um, specifically like painting, like I like a little palette knife, you know, swipe. And I like mixing, you know, I look at, you look at a color on like a reference image or you look at the sky and you're like, what color is that? And then I have to make it, you know, I kind of like that little challenge. And then also just seeing the completed painting come to life is like kind of dope, um, for me. Cause every one at this point is still like, um, a learning experience. Cause I'm still learning. It's not like music where I've been doing it for 20 years. It's like this, I'm, I'm two years in almost, not even. Yeah. And I'm a very much a person that you can do whatever you want in your life. So, you know, being able to step into a new venture and get good at it to me is probably exciting for you. It's a great point. Yeah. I think for me, especially as we get older, I think we try to make life really top heavy. And like, if you don't pull it off by 25, you're never doing it or something. But, uh, I just started learning to paint at 37, you know? And so it's like, uh, who knows what I might decide to learn at 47 or 57, you know, you could, I, I really, um, at least with the arts, you know, I don't think there's any, um, anything I couldn't tackle that I could probably succeed at. Cause I would put in the hours and I dedicate myself to it. And, uh, I think it's always nice when you prove to yourself like, Oh, I can do this too. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you have it too. Oh yeah. Especially even with this podcast that I'm starting, you know, right now it's like, 
this is a new venture, but I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. You know, it's like when you start from zero, there's a lot of growth that's able you're able to have. And, you right. know, just watching something be created out of nothing is kind of a beautiful thing. It is. And it's like, um, you know, you got to get a ton of reps in with it before you're comfortable enough to kind of just settle in and experiment and whatever. And so it's like, you know, you're still with the podcast, you're probably still in the, in the learning phase and, and, but you learn on the fly. If you don't thrust yourself out there and try. Well, this brings me to a good point, dude, is that you just need to get started and try because you don't want to wait till all your ducks are in a line and everything's perfect before you try. I mean, you can try to do that, but you're better off just starting and learning along the way versus, trying to make it perfect before you even start. You probably know a ton of people who super talented or like have an idea and it just never comes to be because they, the problem you just described. Yeah. I always, I have a phrase for it. I'm always like, jump in the pool. You have to jump in you the pool. You know, when dude. you, when you're mid air, you can't, there's no going back. There's no going back. You're splashing in the, in the water. So jump in the pool is always like my, you know, kind of mantra with stuff like that business stuff or like anything like, all right, send it. And then we'll figure it out on the fly. And, and in so far, you know, for the most part, I've had some, some successes and some failures, but usually if I, if I throw my, if I throw it out there, you know, jumping in the pool, um, it's, I've been able to, you know, figure it out after that. Like, even if you jump in and you fail, it's always good because you still learn something from it and then you can never do that again or apply it differently. Right. There's no lesson that's better learned than one you personally get burned on because you never forget. Yeah. You, you never forget. And you like, I always talk about, you know how like, um, there, this is obviously America's a big scam and we're quick to send, um, 18 year olds to college, mm. um, with a $200,000 loan that they have to pay back, but we never give them a $50,000 business loan. I would, ra- I'd rather see something like that. Like give a kid 50 grand, go try to start a business and even if it fails, you have learned so much. Oh yeah. You've learned so much and you, and you're never going to forget those skills. I almost wish there was like a program like that. Yeah. We actually have something in common though, too, because if I'm not mistaken, you are two classes away from graduating or you never graduate, but you had two classes left. Wow. Yeah. That we, that is, that is something we have in common. You didn't graduate. I didn't graduate, but I had two classes left. That was me, man. I dropped out. Yeah. That's funny. I dropped out. Uh, my fifth year in college. So I went not only the four years, but another year because I transferred and changed majors. Um, And in my fifth year in college, after I'd had a baby, I went back to finish my degree. And that's when I got a call from the record label and they signed me for um, the song I'm Awesome. And I dropped out of college. Can we talk about what that phone call was like? Like what were, can you paint the picture of what was going on at that time? Sure. So like the whole picture of my life at that time or like that moment? Maybe let's start with that moment. Okay. okay yeah. So at that moment, I'm I'm commuting to college in Boston. I just had a baby and I'm sitting in class. Um, she's maybe almost one years old. And so I'm sitting in class broke as hell. I have a loan to go to college. I'm delivering pizzas at night. I'm like, I'm also on unemployment like, which you can't be if you have a job. So I'm like lying to the state. So I have a job and I'm on unemployment, you know? And so, um, and my baby mama's a teacher, you know? So she's like not making that much money. So I'm in college trying to get this degree and I'm sitting in English class and I get a, I get a text message. I think, I think text messaging is happening in 2010. Definitely was. So I get a text and it says, Hey, it's, this guy's name from Universal Republic Records, and we want to talk to you about I'm Awesome and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, I don't know about this. Like, I thought it was a scam. And then I got a bunch of phone calls, too, from, like, New York City numbers, and I was like, bill collectors. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, because I was so broke, and I definitely had, like, defaulted on this other loan, and, like, I just thought, like, I'd get – you. I don't know if you've ever owed money on bills, but they call you from all these random numbers, you know, and so I was like, I'm not answering these random numbers. And so I remember texting my dad because I was in class. I was in, like, an English class, and I uh, texted my dad this – the, what I, what they texted me and he like looked him up and he's like, he looks like a real person. It's legit. And so I end up, uh, giving them a call after class and, um, basically they're like, yeah, we love, I'm awesome. We want to fly you down here. We want to talk to you about the future of Spose and blah, blah, blah. 
And what's funny is I didn't have a record label or a manager or anything. So to get my number, they called Bull Moose Music, which is like a, a record dude. store, yeah. a store chain in Maine that, that sell, in New Hampshire that sells, have your CDs. has my CDs. And so, but the reason they had found I'm Awesome was because it was already successful on the radio in Maine mm. on its own, on my, on, on my own merits. Yeah. Um, and, and my own connections. And so it was the number one song on the, the like alternative rock station. And then it jumped over to the pop station, which was like insane. It's dude. over. And then within a couple days, it was number one on the pop station. And when you're number one on the pop station, even in Maine at that time, you're moving a lot of iTunes units. Yeah. So I think Universal just has these like interns going through regional charts and they're like, well, this isn't Kesha or Taylor Swift. Like, what is this? <laughs> you know? And so that was kind of how they had found me for that. Yeah. So what ended up happening from that? Did you go meet with them? So I did, but I felt like such a, this is my whole life. I felt like such an imposter. And I was like, I need them. A, a they're like, bring your team. And I was like, I don't have a team. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad funny, but most independent artists don't. Right. I was, I mean, I was on, that was my 12th song. That's crazy. You know, it's not like I was very early in the process. I, it's so, so I, so I found people to be my managers in like two days. Hilarious, and I dude. Sent them their, their names, like an email to fly us down, and they're like pretending to be my managers. They do become my managers, which was a mistake. But, um, you know, I think at that point I was just so young and naive that I was like, all right, I got to fake it. When in all reality, the thing that had got me there was being authentic. Even I'm awesome. As funny as it is, is this like reaction record. It's an honest thing, you know, and I got there by being honestly me. And I think what the big problem I, I've fucked up the deal with is I wasn't really being myself. I was trying to be who the record label wanted and mm. faking the management. But anyways, to tell the story you're asking about, so I fly to New York with my new managers and we sit down and, and uh, Monty Lippman comes in and he's the owner of Republic Records. Him and his brother Avery own Republic Records and they're sitting down and they've somehow got a copy of my CD from Bull Moose Music. And so they're my first album, which is bad, like not this is not the, like they're releasing The Weeknd. Amy Winehouse, Taylor Swift, Drake, you know, Drake was like a few months after this. And so, you know, they're playing my, re they're playing my songs like on the stereo. And he's like, this is the second single. And he's like going through all the songs. He's like this. And I just remember them, you know, being super enthusiastic, taking me out to dinner. They're taking, you know, they're like, um, they want to go to this fancy restaurant and I made them go to Hooters because I was like, oh, it's too fancy. It's like, it's too fancy, you know, and they're like, ha ha, suppose, you know, or whatever. And so I was just trying to keep it real. And, um, you know, and so basically they offer me a deal and I want to say it was like Tuesday and they were trying to get that deal signed like immediately. And they finally mailed it to me like Friday or something They're like, we want this signed by Monday. And there's all these emails happening and they're just gassing me up. And yeah, you know, basically the deal was for, I know you want to know about the money. Yeah, I did ask. The I, deal I asked suppose before this, if it was okay to talk about the money. To preface this, I was very broke. So, and I, I don't think I'd ever made more than like, I don't know a thousand dollars off my music, mm. you know, like I'd played a show that we sold out the local bar or something. You yeah. know? So it's very early in this process. And so they offer me a deal and it's a, it's a record deal for, they want to sign me for I'm awesome. The song for $35,000. Which, like, at the time, though, was a lot of money, especially if in the position that you were in, dude. I was so broke, and I don't think I, my bank account had ever had more than $3,000. Yeah, so, that, I mean, that's, it's all perspective, dude, because at that time, that's a life-changing amount of money at that time. You, could, I mean, life-changing is not, is, like, accurate. And it did change my life. It's not, a, it's not, like, that, that amount of money, I realize now... And especially a couple weeks after that deal was offered to me, when all these other labels offered me deals, I was like, oh, if I had just waited a couple weeks and played all you labels off each other, I could have got a million dollar deal. Yeah. The thing with record deals is they're loans. Yeah. And the, people don't understand that. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So they give me $35,000, like, and that's all it's phrased as is here's 35 grand, a direct deposit or a check, you know, I forget. And, um, 
but you have to pay that back. Yeah. Before you get any more money. So if you don't make back 35 grand, you never see another dollar. Mm. Fortunate for me, I'm awesome was like a smash. Yeah. Dude. So it was, I made 35 grand for the label in like a week. Yeah. Cause the record went gold. Yeah. Record went gold. It went gold in like two months. So it was like big, which is 500,000 Units. Sales. Yeah. yeah it, it's just sales. It's pre streaming. Yeah. So it's like 500,000 people bought it, you know, in a couple months. And so I recouped all that money almost instantly with Universal, which is cool. Additionally, because when it rains, it pours. Uh, they, in, the, in a good way and a bad way in life. And uh, when I got offered the record deal, all the record industry people know each other. And Republic Records guy Imran calls his buddy Jake at Sony and they offer me a, a publishing deal mm. with Sony. And so I'm like, and Sony offers me for this publishing deal, $75,000. Wow. And so I'm like, yup. <laughs> <laughs> I just like sign it right away. You know, I had a lawyer who a friend had, or a friend had hooked me up with. Um, and so, you know, the lawyer interacts with them and like it appears to be a pretty good contract but little did I little did the fine print tell us is that they'll give you 75 grand and then I was supposed to get another 75 grand when the album was done mm -hmm. but nobody ever asked what happens if the album never comes out oh. yeah the album was made but it never I guess 75 grand when the album comes out on a major label yes so the album never comes out on a major label I get dropped after I'm awesome so the album never comes out so I can't get to this next part of the contract. So I'm stuck in like contract purgatory with Sony. Oh, wow. Forever. For It was like a eight, nine year period. And then I'm finally out of it. But um, so, you know, read your contracts, obviously. But it was it was obnoxious because I'm on Sony ATV publishing, which is, you know, I would always see, I follow them on Instagram and I'd always see artists they're signing, you know, and it's yeah. like Russ and like uh, Drake, you know, and like, you know, or whoever. And so they've got the biggest artists in the world and I'm down at number 1,448 or whatever on the totem pole. And I can't get any, I can't get, you know, publishers are supposed to set you up with like sessions and syncs and all these things. And it's like, they don't, they're not doing shit for me. So it's like, um, that was real obnoxious because I couldn't then even go to another publisher. Yeah. And then even I would get offered things. Like I remember the, the major league soccer, um, team, the new England revolution. Okay. Offered me this. They wanted me to make a song for their playoff run. That's so I, awesome. Right. And so I did, and I had decap produce it. Oh, and amazing. we, we made this dope song and then when the revs go to get permission from Sony ATV, they're like, we want 70 grand. We want all this. We, and it's like, man, it's like a real, if you know, like some personal publishing relationship would have been like, Hey, this would be important for me. Let's make this happen at a, at a rate that's agreeable for everybody. So that was kind of the downside of being on big, big dog yeah. publishing. If you're not the big dog, basically. So what was the reason the album didn't come out? So I'm awesome goes gold, right? And so they pick up, so the, the contract said, my contract with Republic, Universal Republic, was um, if the single sells, not even gold, 225,000, like half gold, I don't know what you call that, bronze or something, <laughs> silver, if it goes silver, um, I would get automatically picked up for the album deal. So it does that instantly. So I'm picked up for the album deal. So they're like, let's make the album. And so they unlock this budget of, you know, I think we had some like 150 grand or something to make this album, but we were, our goal was like, let's spend as little, little as, as possible. possible. Yeah. Right. Cause you have to recoup it all. It's like, here's, yeah, here's 150 grand, but then you have to make it all back. So, you know, I, uh, so I was recording, you know, in Maine, I was trying to make a album kind of authentically here, but also, you know, the influence of the label that's pushing hit songs, you know, is, is very much overbearing in this whole process. So they keep flying me out to Los Angeles and I'm working with um, those producers, the Cataracts, and I'm in there who are known for, they did a bunch of those songs like Like a G6 I'm and like all the dev dude. and the, yeah, yeah. So those guys are hilarious and I was in there with them and we we're making these, they're making me make these songs that are nothing like Spose songs, you know, but it's like, it's the weakest party ever, you know, it's like, <laughs> but they're like bangers, you know, they probably would have worked, but like, you know, and I'd send them to the label and they're like, ah, 
they're like, this ain't, they're like, if it sounded like a hit, they're like, sounds like a hit, but it doesn't sound like you. And then it's like, oh, this, this sounds like you, but it does, I don't know. It's kind of all over the, it's like, no, it was never right. So they had a lot of like creative input that they weren't rocking with basically. Totally. Yes. The, the Republic would, you know, in a lot of this, I do chalk the whole experience up to my naivete about the whole situation. I didn't know what it was like to be on a record label. I'm 24. Yeah. I'm 24. I just had a baby. I'm like trying to figure out life. I'm on my 12th song. I've never been in a studio session. And so they fly me to LA and I just supposed to figure it out. And you, to me, were like new ground because it's not like you can ask any of your homies. Like this is like, right. You know, to me, you're one of the first people from Maine really making like plays like that, you know? It, yeah, I really... I really was. I'm not the first artist from Maine to ever sign a deal. There have been artists before me. The rapper Poverty, this band Jeremiah Freed, and this band, the, the Rustic Overtones, yeah. the tattoo, on, tattoo on my hand, um, the Rustic Overtones, have all signed deals, but nobody came out of the woodwork really with like any good advice or... And also, I'm a little different. I'm not any of those artists. That's what so, I'm saying. And additionally, the music landscape in 2010 is very strange. It's like pop rap, B.O.B., you know, even like Wiz Khalifa exists, but he's making like pop records to try to fit in. And like it's pre Mac Miller. And so it, like shooting your own videos. And so a lot of it was just a strange moment. And um, I think if I had followed my heart a little more and my my intuition, I could have really done better. But without the information. You're really, you know, destined to fail. You know, I didn't have the information or the connections or the experience to be like, nah, this is what we're, you know, you know, the whole situation would have recorded would have required a whole lot of nah from me. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're going, we're flying you to LA. We're going in with this. Well, I'll be like, nah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that I didn't know that was like an option, you know? And so I'm kind of just like flying by the seat of my pants in that experience a lot. And I do wish there had been some precedent of artists from Maine, um, to kind of reach out to, to, to get advice, um, or even just artists I knew. Um, cause since then, you know, I, I feel like I've been very forthcoming whenever anybody's been in a position or offered a contract and I'm like, I oh, don't know, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, when people are offered a contract, I'm usually like, I don't know. You know, I'm not like sign that shit. Let's go. You know? Yeah. But that's one thing I like about you too, is that you embrace a lot of the other artists from Maine that are on the, on the rise. And I see that like, not all artists do that, dude. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, to be honest, it's like I'm 38 and I've been doing music professionally now for 14 years. So it's like, I'm looking for new inspiration. <laughs> you know, if we're going off the same shit I came in with, that's, that's all came and went. So it's like, I'm always excited when I see some new, new cats coming out in, in Maine. And I always try to be like supportive Unless they're a douche, you know, That's usually, fair. and usually the douchebags will sort themselves. You don't got to worry about them because they take themselves out anyways. So it's like, um, you know, I, I've just found so much friendship and talent with, um, but not only with me, but like the generation before me with Dave Gutter from the Rustic Overtones, who's like a friend of mine, me and him and, and Ben's been dead, who probably represent three different generations of main music. Like we're in the studio together all the time. Like we're bros, you know, and, and, and I think we are all. And I, maybe Dave had an ego more when he was younger, but I think him and me both kind of represent like, yo, we are like just trying to have fun and make music. And if you are providing us with some new sort of inspiration and we can help in any way, like that's, that's mutual, you know, it's a mutual relationship. Um, obviously I just wanted to, I mean, I don't know where the world stands on this, but Kanye West is like a big inspiration of mine. And he's always reinventing himself, dude. Right. And always using the next kind of generation to get the inspiration. I mean, even with Yeezus, you know, which is 10 years ago now, I remember it being uh, shocking that he had this producer, Travis Scott, producing stuff. You know, obviously Travis is now like one of the biggest artists in the world, but like Travis Scott was this producer he kind of took on. And then he's got Chief Keef on a song when he, you know, with Boney Vare, you know, and like, I just love that embracing of kind of everybody. I don't think there's any artist I can't like learn something from or give something to, you know. I want to pull it back to a little bit of the label talk for a second because what's something that you learned from that experience that maybe could help an artist that's on the rise? Right. Yeah. I think the biggest thing I learned from the record 
industry experience is that the thing that got you there is the thing that will get you through it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, yes, you're now in the majors or you're, or whatever label you're on and you now have to go even harder. Like no question. Like if you weren't taking it this serious, it needs to go more serious. But I think the biggest thing is like your gut and your ideas and your intuition got you here. So don't now that you're in that position, start taking all this outside advice and shifting you into all these directions you wouldn't have gone. It's like, what would have been the trajectory if you never had that label? A is the question. And B, how do you use the label to maintain that vision and do exactly what you would have done, but just bigger and better? Yeah. And I think that's actually great advice because Sometimes people just don't know how to, when opportunities are coming, they think you're supposed to be a certain type of way when right. you just got to be yourself. Well, and that's, you know, I mean, it's like a cliche, but like, you're the only you, you know? And so it's like, there is something to be said for leaning more into yourself and not trying to kind of, kind of homogenize to industry trends or things you see other people do, or, you know, cause, cause the only even like marketing wise, the only idea that works is the idea nobody's done before. Mm. So it's like stick to stick to your gut and your intuition, especially when you're in the label machine. Speaking of ideas that have never been done before, dude, you did an album in one day, dude. Can we talk about this? Yes, we can. So I want to say it was like 2017, 2018. I'd done six, seven albums at that point. And I was like, Let's see if we can do one in one day. And like uh, a lot of things, you know, the day that we made the album, which I think was October 5th, 2017, a lot of that moment came from me building relationships over the years, me figuring out what musicians worked well together, me learning how to manage large groups of people from doing um, concerts or music videos or like whatever, and just kind of honing my skills of people leadership. So when it came time for that day, you know, we get in the studio and obviously I am, I am the captain now. And, and I told, and I, and I kind of directed everyone. I was like, this is the goal. We're making a Spo's album. We know kind of what that is, but there's no rules musically. We could go anywhere. And even leading up to it, I'd sent a bunch of emails to everybody, kind of hyping everybody up, getting everybody's availability times for the day, you know, from 10 a.m. to 10 a.m. the next day, like what times everybody's available, kind of planning groups of people who could work together because we're in the studio, the halo that has all these different rooms. And I would kind of bounce around room to room. And I'm like, yo, what if we made a song called humans? And the pre-chorus is like lions and tigers and bears. There's only one thing that's got them all scared, humans. And then I'm like, but I want it to sound like David Bowie, modern love. And then I come back two hours later and that's what I fucking got. You know, you know, and so, you know, and then I'm like, all right, get, bounce that to an MP3. I'm going to go sit in the car where none of this is happening and write verses, you know, and so we made the whole album ends up being called Humans. We made it in a day and with time to spare. I think at 6 a.m. I drank a beer, you know, to celebrate. Incredible, dude. Yeah. But, you know, something about that is that it's it's a very ambitious idea to pull off an album in one day. And someone may not realize that listening in. But logistically and all the things that go and vibe wise, like, I mean, all it takes is one bad moment right. to derail that whole experience. Right. So I had a bunch of, and this was stolen from Kanye too. If you ever saw the dark twisted fantasy session pictures in Hawaii, there was these rules on like little sheets of eight and a half by 11 paper on the wall. And it was like, no, no phones, no, whatever, you know, all these things. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I put a bunch of those on the on the thing. And one of them was no bad vibes. It was outlawed. You know, there was no bad vibes allowed, but, but I made sure there was no bad vibes because I only invited people who I knew had never created a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it really, the people management thing is really big part of it. Cause it's like, if you're creating a team or you're running a restaurant or you're whatever, you put one person in there who's a negative character and it poisons the whole thing. And so it was really important to bring in all good vibes, people keep the vibes happy. Um, I was kind of bouncing around as like coach, you know, like go and and also uh, an active participant and like creative. I was tossing out ideas left and right. And and 
I was trying to, the only bad, I, another sign said, the only bad idea is no idea. Mm. Like toss, toss out, out any ideas. Like we're trying to, we, we had no, we went in with no pre-written anything. So there was the rule. There was no beats, no hooks, no anything until that morning. I was like, I'm going to start thinking of stuff that morning, you know, as I was going in. But, um, you know, uh, the only bad idea is no idea, no bad vibes. And I, and I think, um, you know, just me letting my enthusiasm kind of lead everyone, you know, and I did a couple like mass text. Um, hey, at 4 p.m., meet me in the in the kitchen of the studio and we're going to have a check in on everything. And so I had a, you know, a whiteboard and I was, you know, I was really trying to run it like a like a mission and with my eyes on the prize. Writing all the verses became like, T, you know, very difficult by the end of it because I was trying to make it as good as any Spose album. Yeah, and it is really good. Thank you, which takes, you know, usually like a year. So it was like, uh, but having done that, you know, it's just almost like learning to paint. It's almost like, can I do this? Yes, I can. You know, and I think that's like a skill set that I can apply to things in my life, you know, forever. One thing I'm also curious, I'm going to change it a little bit, but your song, I'm Awesome, got used for Mr. D. Yes. Have you ever seen this show? I actually have, but only because I knew your song was used. Okay, crazy. Yeah. So again, when it rains, it pours. And when I'm awesome's out, I'm getting not only the record deal, the publishing deal. I did a pilot for MTV, uh, but you know, it's getting used in all these commercials. And then Mr. D, this Canadian sitcom about a, a gym teacher who has to be the English teacher or something because it gets, you know, because of layoffs. Uh, picks up my song to be the theme song. And it's not only the theme song, but like between every scene, it's like, awesome, awesome. <laughs> you know, it's like, or like something from the from the beat. And so that made me a shitload of money. I was every ask year. about it because yeah. I'm pretty sure from what I know, every time the show gets renewed, it gets upped a little bit. Correct. Yeah, every, yes. So it, so, you know, and I've talked to other people who've had their songs used in shows and, and I think I hit the jackpot because a lot of shows don't make it two seasons. Some of them don't even make it to one season because they just shoot the pilot and that's it. Yeah. So I was, they hit me up just to use it for the pilot. So I didn't even know if it, and then when it got picked up for season one, I was like, dope. And I'll just, I think I posted it on TikTok one time, but it was basically, I think $1,500 for every episode the first season. And then every subsequent season, it went up by like 10% or something. So, Incredible, dude. So per episode. How many seasons did it go? So it went eight, nine seasons. Come and on, so dude. every year, Sony, the publishing company, sending me these, you know, it was like 30, 40 grand a couple, you know, once a year at least for Mr. D for the whole decade of the 2010s. So I'm awesome. Definitely was a gift they kept on giving in that regard. And then also a decade later, I'm seeing Dixie D'Amelio saying it's her favorite song, dude. That's right. I got to admit, I did not know. <laughs> the Deme I'm old, man. Yeah. I did not know the D'Amelios until this day. But I have a daughter who is now 14, but I think she was probably like 11 at the time when Dixie, or maybe 12 when Dixie yeah. D'Amelio posted this. Dixie and Charlie, Charlie D'Amelio both were both in this clip. And and Dixie goes, you know, they're like, what's your favorite song? And she's like, I'm awesome, but I suppose. And, and Charlie D'Amelio goes like, that's a good one or yeah. something. And so then people, this was the first day I ever used TikTok too. Like I'd never even used it because I was like, I don't know how to, you know. So I was like, how I was asking my daughter, I was like, how do I, how do I duet it? How do you know how do I do this? And so uh that was dope. And um I did reach out to Dixie D'Amelio and she was like, Oh my god, you're the goat, you know. And so it was pretty cool. I actually had an opportunity to work with the family too before they were famous. That's right. Yeah, you did. Dude, so basically the father was running for state Senate or something before they were famous, dude. And I did all the promo videos for him. So I spent an entire day with the family. Nicest family ever, by the way. Really? Yeah. But, uh, so I spent the, the entire day with them and we're driving around. We're going to get ice cream. We got hibachi together. Damn. But yeah, no, it's, it's crazy though. And it's insane to see how they've like leveled up since that point. Huge. I mean, even since the point where she said the Spose thing, they've become these like mainstream stars, not yeah. TikTok. You know, it was like TikTok dance stars at the time. And now they're, you know, they got their own show and everything. And obviously you gave them their start by <laughs> filming them at their house. No, Mark is the man, dude. He gave me a lot of good advice back in the day too, that I like kind of hold close to my heart just about like basically kind of what we were saying about staying true to yourself and, you know, not giving so, up. 
what did he do before he was like running for office? Like, what was his? I don't job? know the exact, but I know that he was into like licensing for like clothing a lot. Oh, crazy! He gave me a windbreaker that I should wear on one of these. Bring them out. Yeah, but no, it was really good rocking with that family, and then because they're a Connecticut family. So right, yeah, they're from here. Okay, crazy. Yeah, that's wild, man. What a wild story. Yeah, I want to bring it back to I'm awesome. Like on a final thought on this. And was there anything else that I'm awesome, like caused in your life or an opportunity that I'm sure there's a lot, but like one main thing that you could think of too, that just like was game changing for you. I mean, I'm awesome. Definitely changed my life in so many ways. I mean, literally that song alone brought me hundreds of thousands of dollars when I'd never made probably like 30 grand in a year, you know, I was like waiting tables. So it definitely changed my life financially. Um, it, gave me a crash course in the music industry, literally crashed out of it in like 11 months. Um, and, but also got, got me a gold single, got me, you know, my, my music everywhere. I played huge festival, huge, like radio station festivals and baseball parks. I'm opening for Weezer and Stone Temple Pilots in, in Iowa for 16,000 people, Insane, you know, like dude. crazy stuff when I'd only ever played for a couple hundred people in Maine. So this was like life changer. One experience that it gave me that I haven't really talked about too much, but it ended up, I ended up getting offered this show with MTV and they basically fly me down to New York and I stay in Times Square for the whole week and I bring my baby mama and our baby and we're up in New York City and I'm like thinking this show is going to get picked up. So I'm like looking at apartments, like I'm going to move to New York City and I'm like, what is my life right now? And even the pilot, they paid me $7,500, I think, for just to do the pilot. And then Same. and then every episode was going to be like 15 grand an episode five days a week. So I was like, yo, I'm going to be so rich, you know, and I'm like planning my life out with that. And so we, we get down there to do the pilot and it was supposed to be this, I think it was supposed to be called celebrity mashup or something in the emails, you know, they're sending us like a script and all this stuff. And we get down there and it's me and this girl, Aaron Lucas, who was on the show, the Hills mm. and me and her are the hosts. And so we end up bonding really well because we're like both kind of just doing the same thing. And we're like, and we get down there and they're like changing the show to this other show. And we're like, yo, what the fuck? And so then we're a couple of days into doing the show and me and Aaron are like, we're taking over this show. And we start doing our, we're like, start making it kind of like, no, nah, what if it was this, you know? And, and I think they didn't like that. And so <laughs> the show never gets picked up. We don't even get, I don't even ever get to see the pilot. That's crazy. I wish I could see it so bad. It's somewhere out there. It ex it's on like a, I don't know, a DVD in somebody's like pile of DVDs somewhere at Viacom. That's crazy. And so it didn't get picked up. And that was like, you know, that year, the I'm Awesome year was like so many ups and downs, but like you just get so used to um, disappointment <laughs> oh, in no, a way. Dude. It's sad, but like, you know, up until then I'd, I'd cut my music career had just been like up, 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 up. And then after I'm Awesome was kind of my first experience with like, yo, we're out in LA send the email, all the songs we made to the label. And they're like, nah, these aren't it. Mm, that's gotta and then be heartbreaking. The pilot doesn't get picked up. I'm like, oh damn. And then I lose the record deal and that puts me in limbo in the publishing deal. And then I'm like, how am I going to make money? You know, it was a very tough, it was like that year was like, yeah. you know, every emotion you can imagine. So I'm sure that was probably mentally taxing. You, totally. And at the end of it, maybe feeling like a little defeated. Yeah. How do you bounce back from that? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I bounced back basically by doing the only thing I knew how, which was to thrust myself into making more songs. I was like, well, I still have some of these fans. I've always said, I think I retained like 1% of the people who were fans from I'm Awesome, mm. which is not meant like it really was a, that, that conversion rate you would want to be much higher, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, but those 1% of people I was able to build into like a pretty consistent kind of cult fan base over the years. And so I bounced back by making this album called the audacity. And that was kind of where I started to take control of the Spose brand that kind of had got steered into this 
goofy, like kind of even the I'm awesome video is not what I would have done, you know, like so. So this was me kind of course correcting back to the the first video off that album was G Willikers. And that's one of my bigger videos. And I'm and I really think that album, the day I dropped that album, I will never forget people's like responses, even people I knew who are like, whoa, this is deeper than I thought, you know, the, the Spose brand, you know, and so uh, that from that from the success of that album, which that day I dropped it, got up to like number three on the iTunes, like rap albums chart, like that many people buying it. And that, I mean, that album's made me hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, over the years. And so that was like a big, okay, I'm independently with no manager, no label, no anything able to make a salary in a year off what is essentially strange suburban white dad rap. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm really about this, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of goes back to jumping in the pool because you had to jump into a new pool and it gave you that confidence to probably keep going where it's like, this is possible and I can do this on my own. Right. Yeah. I think when I was able to prove it to myself with, um, the audacity of that album, uh, I was like, oh, okay, this is what I'm going to, you know, cause I didn't know after I'm awesome. I was like, well, I, I was trying to find another deal. I was like, maybe somebody will pick me up for some other deal. And then I kept getting all this advice from other people, like after the deal happened and the deal got, you know, and I got dropped and one funny story kind of, kind of circling back to I'm awesome. But one funny story is, um, after I got dropped from universal Republic, I put out this song called pop song, which is about my experience on universal Republic. It's like how they just wanted me to write a pop song. Yeah. Even though I got success from doing an unorthodox song with no melodies, you know, that, that no, that sounded like nothing else on the radio. So they wanted me to make these radio records. So I made this song pop song and I put it out on my own kind of right after I'd got dropped. Yeah. And I took me and, you know, baby moms and Lily to Florida for like February vacation with like the last of my universal money. I don't think I really let on that it was like running out, but it was like, okay. I remember getting to Florida. And I was like, I don't have much money left, you know? And so we're on vacation. I get an email from Imran Majid who signed me at yeah. Republic. Hadn't heard from him in months. It's like hearing from your ex-girlfriend or yeah. something. <laughs> and he hits me up and he sends me a, li a YouTube link to pop song. And he goes, this should be on the radio. And Come I'm on, like, dog. You don't say. I had sent it to him. He had heard it. It's like, you know, and it's like, then fucking make it happen, dog. Like, what? You're just sending me, you are a guy who gets songs on the radio. So that was a little frustrating. But also it was a kind of a vote of confidence. Yeah. It's like the ex-girlfriend being like, you're still hot. Yeah, that's super <laughs> funny, dude. Well, yeah. I want to talk to you about touring a little bit. Like, at what point do you start touring in well, so my first tour I ever did was I'm Awesome radio promo tour where I'm flying all across the country, getting picked up in limos, playing in baseball parks. Insane, dude. That's like an, an insane introduction to touring, dude. Yeah, it's not realistic. No, my first touring was in the back of like a, a sedan, dude, driving around the country. <laughs> That's what it should have been. Yeah. You know, up until that point, I I had not even, I had played Portsmouth, New Hampshire, was the farthest I'd ever played, I think. Yeah. And so... That was my first tour was the, I'm, um, you know, I'm flying all around the country tour, all expenses paid, baseball stadiums, football stadiums. My second tour was a 12 passenger van in November of 2012 playing for literally 20 people, 30 people, 15 people in the cold, making no money because the cost of touring was greater than I was bringing in. Maybe I, a couple nights made some money, but that was, I really had to build it back up from scratch. Yeah. You know, eventually now I'm at the point where I could go on tour and we got people everywhere. Yeah. Almost everywhere in the country, except New Orleans, I do all right. You know, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but there's too much going on in New Orleans, but um, well, I'm just not that big. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, the thing too about, that tour with like the 30, 40 people, it's like, those are 30, 40 people that actually care and are there for you, dude. And a lot of them are still there, are still here. I still see some of those people because I always, you know, it's kind of the gift and the curse of the Spose brand that it's me. 
you know, because I really don't have some other persona I put on when I'm meeting the fans or talking to you or going to Dunkin' Donuts. And so they really get an authentic me. And when there's only 30 people at the show, I'm at the, I'll go sell the merch and I want to meet you all. Yeah. And I'll, and, but to this day, I've kind of created that precedent that like after the show, I'll go to the merch booth and I'll stay there till the last person in line is done telling me their story, signing all their stuff. And, and I think that creates bigger fans. Yeah. I think it's almost like I always try to give, you know, like say you're, pay, if you're paying me 20 bucks, I want to give you 50 bucks worth of show of meet and greet of like whatever. Um, Cause I think that just overdoing over delivering even like on my music, it's like, all right, you thought it was this, here's this too, you know, but wait, to, there's more, but wait, there's more. Yeah, exactly. And if there's ever not a, but wait, there's more, that's probably the end. You know, there's, a, I'm always trying to push it in new directions. And I, I even saw a Spose fan say the other day on X. Oh tw yeah. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> what is it called? Uh, they said this on Twitter. They were like, um, I love, they're like, uh, they were talking to some other Spose fan about, about uh, a playlist they'd made of Spose songs. And they're like, I can't wait for more. And they're like, the best part is you never fucking know what it's going to sound like, you know, yeah. because I kind of do keep pushing it musically because I'm trying to stay intrigued myself. But also if I'm selling you the same thing every time you eventually, you know, lose interest. Yeah. I want to talk to you about a wild experience. I know that you had on tour, dude. Okay. Can we talk about Ron Snow? Wow. He lives. Yeah, we could talk about Ron can Snow. You, yeah, can you give everyone the full picture of what's well, going on? So one time I'm on tour and we're playing L.A. And we're playing the Viper Room, which is this legendary shitty venue on the Sunset Strip. And so we're playing the show. And before the show, I'm selling merch. And they have this weird downstairs place you have to sell merch. And I remember this fan comes up and he's in a, a Spose shirt that's like an XXL. But he's like skinny inside it and he's sh he wore this shirt that he'd bought years ago to show me how much weight he'd lost and so I remembered him you know as I'm up on stage and I'm spitting and I'm doing um you know and any performer can probably relate to this I'm sure you've had the same experience where you're rapping you're doing a song and you see the person who knows the words mm. you'll never forget the whole time you're on stage where that person is right so so I'm doing a couple songs and there's a lot of smoke and haze and lights at the Viper room and but I can see him and he's rapping every word. This dude, Ron rapping, you know, rapping every word. And I keep coming back over to him and there's this girl over here who's rapping all the words. And so I'm doing, doing my songs. I'm doing the King of Maine and I, he's over here. He's rapping. I go over to this girl. She's spitting it and I get back over to him and he's gone. And his brother, or I didn't know, I think it was his brother, or his friend is standing right behind him. And he's like, I like looking for him and he like points at the ground and I look and he's like on the ground, like, I don't know, dying or having a seizure or something. And so I turned to Channing, the DJ, and I'm like, yo, cut the music. So Chan's like, Dirt. and, and I'm like, I think I like jump down maybe. And he, his friends, like he's, he's, I don't know what he had told me was happening, some sort of medical event. So I stopped the show. I'm like, does anybody know how, is anybody, we, we need to call an ambulance, we need to whatever. And there was a couple fans, the staff had no fucking clue what to do. They're just some like LA hipsters who are like, ah! they freaked out, didn't know what to do. I think maybe they called the ambulance. But then a couple of my fans in the audience were like nurses or doctors. And so they launch into doing like chest compressions and like mouth to mouth and trying to save Ron who's dying, like dead on the floor. And so we usher all the other fans out. They're like, sorry, everybody like shows over. They go wait outside and Ron, uh, dies on the floor of the Viper room. The ER comes in and pronounces him like basically dead, puts him in the, the ambulance, takes him to the hospital. I'm texting people trying to, I'm trying to find like his family on Twitter to like figure out, you know, anything. Um, and me and Chan are at IHOP on the sunset strip, just like tripping, like bugging out. Can't believe this happened. Um, and so they take him to the hospital. 
uh, before we go, we have all the out, the fans come back in and we do a kumbaya hand clap version of knocking on wood and like cry. It was just so sad. And so we think Ron's dead. And like two days later, we get a message from like his wife that Ron medically died for eight minutes, but survived. They were able to resuscitate him at the hospital in L.A. And so he lives and now he walks with a cane. And whenever we're in L.A., he comes out and uh, shout out Ron Snow. But that's like insane that like I'm glad he's good. You know? he had a, so basically he had a heart attack. That's terrible. dude. Yeah. Fucking crazy, man. Maybe we bring it back a little bit. Sure. I know that you worked at a newspaper illegally. Oh, yeah, I sure did. Um, you got some wild facts. So uh, you've done your research. I suppose we have to know. <laughs> okay, Nardwar. The um, Mardwar? Nardwar. Squardwar? Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, when I was 10, I got a job at a newspaper because... I was like a young computer nerd and I knew how to use this program. I knew how to use like computer programs and my mom was a babysitter. She like babysat a bunch of kids at like a daycare. And so she babysat this lady who worked at the newspapers kid. And she was like, well, my son maybe could help with this at the newspaper. So this lady, Sharon brings me to her newspaper that she runs and I fixed whatever the problem was. And then she's like, could you also do, she asked me if I could, if I could make an ad like in Adobe page maker. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I bet I could figure it out. And so she showed me the, this other chick, Kelly, who's this hot British woman. She's like my first love, showed me this program page maker. And I, I figured it out right away. And so I became an ad designer at age 10, making $10 an hour under the table illegally. You know, they, I got cash every week. And so as a 10 year old, I was making like bank, like a couple hundred dollars a week. Cause I'd work there after school till like eight, 9 PM. And then they'd drive me home and I worked there till I was 15. It's so like five whole years. And I started writing for the newspaper really poorly. Cause I'm a teenager. Um, but, um, you know, and I, I, they became like almost like family to me. Cause I was like, um, I didn't really like being at home. You know, it wasn't like super safe all the time. And so I was like happy to be uh, at the newspaper as late as possible, you know, and it was, they let me listen to my music and I would be, I'd be learning computer programs. And I even remember when like, I wanted to buy tickets to go see Weezer. I gave Sharon like cash and she let me use her debit card, you know, to buy them on the phone. You know, this is like, a, you know, this is like crazy era, but I was like 10 years old. And so that was a really formative time of my life. Cause I, I think I really learned, you know, how to work with people. It gave me a lot of confidence too. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'm the child prodigy. You know, I'm, I'm working at, I'm everybody else here is all old, <laughs> you know, 18, 22, you know, 30, you know, so it was cool. And then you had a band in high school called the frothy four. Kinda. So frothy four was a rap group. We started. Okay. Previous to the, fr which only started because I was kicked out of a band called fight shirt. Oh, wow. So fight shirt, um, was a band we started in eighth grade and it was basically like, you know, alternative rock, you know, and I played guitar and I wrote a couple songs and my buddy, Sam Matt Sampson was the sticky one was the real great singer, better guitarist lead of the band. But I was the one who was like, yo, we got to rehearse. Yo, we got to play a show. I'll make the flyer. I'll do it. Cause I'm the doer, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a talk about it you know, guy. So I was like, I never was even in, I think that was annoying. And that's probably what's led you to where you are in your career now is just making it happen. A hundred percent because I know 150 more talented people than me who are working at other jobs because they did not do that, that stuff. Like they could play, they could sing, they could write, they had ideas, they were artists, but it's the, no, we're actually going to follow through and finish it. I'm going to book the show. I'm going to call and book a show. I'm going to get us audio equipment. I'm going to sell tickets. I'm going to call. I had to get a police officer to come be at our show because it was more than a hundred people. I did all that, you know, when I was like 14. So it's like when it gets to be the time that I needed to be spose, I already have like 10 years experience of like using computers, talking to people, organizing events, selling tickets, making flyers. Like, so it's not like I came in like, what do I do to, to, 
to sell this music. It's like that shit I already kind of knew better than the music. You know, it almost took my music longer to catch up with my skill set. And I want to jump forward a little bit, too, and talk about Suicide Doors. That's a record we have together. Yeah, man. Dude. That's a real special song, man. I was going to say, because, you know, in a time where everyone is trying to make short songs, like quick consumer, like streaming songs. Yeah. That song still crushes, and it's like six minutes long. I don't know why I was doing a third verse. I was like Migos doing the, like, oh, now we got a fourth verse. But no, that song, man, that we made, you made this beat that is fantastic, and it just inspired this this song out of me. Um, and Pimo sang the hook that, that I, I kind of wrote, and he reinterpreted it. Um, and it was a great collaborative process between us um, to make that song, but the the... I've always had a lot of sympathy for um, famous people. I know I'm like alone maybe in that sometimes, but like I just, you know, like Michael Jackson or something or even um, Britney Spears or whatever. It's a lot of jokes and LOLs and like whatever. But if you were a child who never got to be a child and you're scrutinized every picture of you and taking pictures of you while you're looking ugly and published in magazines it's like it's hard enough being a person as it is being self-conscious and so that song suicide doors is a lot like is a, is a lot about dead celebrities or celebrities who they're you kind of push to the brink um and how our society kind of eats them alive you put them in a cage and you you poke poke the bear till the bear you know fires back or kills themselves or whatever and so that song suicide doors is more about like the door to suicide than suicide doors on a car um but i'm really proud of that i really feel like that's like one of my you know better better contributions musically i remember seeing it live at p day and christmas and it always felt like a moment dude yeah we did it the first time i think with the montage of like kind of dead celebrities that i i made them all grayscale yeah you know on the screen and it was like you know and and it's you know it's a couple years old but i mean we're talking about mac miller and and amy winehouse and you know all these you know uh, chester from lincoln park and all these celebrities that like even if it's not suicide it's like the fame kind of like is a is a contributor and, and there's just no sympathy really from the public meanwhile the public wouldn't last i think i say it i like the public wouldn't last 10 minutes as kim kardashian you know it's like to be scrutinized like that your whole life and have the pressure to be this and to be you know there's a sex tape of you everyone's making fun of you about anytime you know it's like could you survive that you know could you survive everyone looking at you staring at you i will say my one experience with fame is just you know when i'm awesome was on the radio and i was this like low in maine i was a very like public figure and i always equate it to being like a super hot girl like being famous must be what it's like to be a super fucking hot girl. Like everywhere you walk, everybody's like looking at you and then they try to not look at like when you catch them, they try to pretend they're not. And it was like, I'd go to the Olive Garden in Biddeford, Maine. And that's like what it was, you know? And so, um, you know, I just have a lot of sympathy for those people. And I think, you know, for that song to try to put it in perspective, I think is kind of a unique idea. Yeah. And one thing that I know and love about you, dude, is that you were able to take the moment of, you know, some people will have a moment like I'm awesome and then that'll be it. You know, you have a full career now and maybe we could talk a little bit about that where what do you think has been a con like a contributor to your longevity? I think being more and more and more authentically myself over time has been the key. I think if you listen to my most recent albums, you could see the transition over the years to be even more vulnerable and more open and more guitars and more who I really was when I was 10 years old working at the newspaper. Um, and, and, and it took me years to like shed what I thought people wanted of me um, to be just me, <laughs> you know? And I think that is part of the longevity. Another a couple other things that have contributed to the longevity would be consistency. I really have tried to consistently put out pretty solid product with 
kind of, you know, not to big up myself, but like kind of clever, at least unique marketing ideas. Um, cause the music's never enough and you need something else to draw people's attention when everyone in the world can make a song on garage band. And so I think consistency has been key, keeping my ideas unique, continually evolving. Um, and then I think being really, uh, like there for my fans in a way, like I'm pretty, you're pretty easy to access. If you, you know, obviously maybe if I was at a, maybe if I'm playing arenas, I can't be this guy, but when I'm playing, you know, the 300, 400, you know, in Maine, I'm playing the thousand, 1100 cap, whatever, smaller rooms. It's like, I can, um, I can, resp if you tell me you're getting married and this would be amazing if your wife got this, you know, her favorite song is this and could, could you just shout her out for the wedding? It's like, yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so that goes a long way. Cause like they, you know, it's like no effort for me, you know, it's like to film a quick video or, or to respond to an email or just sign something for somebody. And that goes a long way that they'll stick with me for the next couple years do you have an experience with like maybe a fan or a supporter or somebody that like stood out to you that really maybe they said something to you that really put your career in perspective and felt like you were making a difference i'm gonna tell you a story this is really wild um and this is maybe super this is maybe i, I could tell you a couple i certainly have a lot of good ones yes i have a lot of good ones where like you know there was this girl who couldn't come to my show in Dallas cause she was in the hospital and her friend was like, she's so sad. She can't come to the show. Could you maybe just send her an email or I recorded her a video. I was on, it was in Dallas, Texas. And I sent it to her and her friend sent me a video of her watching the video. And she's like crying like, Oh my God. You know? And so it's like, that was really special, you know? And that, and that's great when I can, um, help, when I can help, it's, it's really, it's really nice. And it is really inspiring that like, it would mean that to people. Um, but I had a, an experience this year and I was having a really hard year. I was having really like tough personal times and I was really struggling mentally. And I played this show in this, and I got back to the hotel and this fan who was at the show was staying in the same hotel and he gets in the elevator with me and someone else. And, um, someone else leaves. I think it was KG freeze. My friend goes and this guy's like, suppose, can I talk to you for a minute? And he goes, you know, cause I have all these songs about gratitude. I have all these songs about appreciating your life and, and, um, being thankful for what you have and keeping things in perspective. And that's how you don't want to die. And so this dude says to me, he flew from Indiana to come to Maine to this show. We're in the hotel after the show. And it, I'm outside the elevator and he goes, suppose I gotta ask you a question. He goes, um, what do you do when you've knocked on all the wood? And you, which is a reference to my song, knocking on wood about appreciating stuff. And you've, he, he referenced a few other lyrics of mine specifically that he uses as like mantras. Clearly, you know, he's like, what do you do when you've done all that? And it's still not enough. And you essentially he's saying like, and you want to die. And I was like, I'm going to be honest, man. I'm just like a person. And I'm having a really hard time right now too. And I don't know. I wish I had the answer for you, man. I wish I did. I was like, sometimes I can't see, I can't knock on the wood and I can't see the, the positive. And right now is one of those moments, man. And I'm like, super sorry. And he was like, it's crazy that you just said that, you know? And it was like, I think it, it somehow was just like, oh, everybody feels this stuff yeah. helped him. But for me, it was wild because it was like, I can't help you. It was like, I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the, you flew across the country to see me, to save you. And I can't save you. So it's like that moment really stuck out to me. Yeah, but it just shows that we're all human too. And I think sometimes that gets lost. And especially when we're talking about like a suicide door, as you know, that like all these people, yeah. like all your favorite creatives, all your favorite artists, all your favorite influencers are people too with actual feelings and go through things. Right. Yeah, that's great. That's a great way to tie in. Exactly, man. And, and that's, I think that's why empathy is important and why just to know that every person's a, a person, you know, there's no, there's, you know, to be honest, sometimes I meet people who, um, are famous people, you know, and, and you meet them 
sometimes you meet them and they're assholes, but sometimes you meet them and you're like, oh, I get why you are so successful because you're just authentically a regular fucking person in the face of all this stuff. You remained you and that's why it works. I will just shout out my friend Amy Allen, who's another artist from Maine who is basically one of the biggest songwriters on earth. And she writes all these songs for Harry Styles. I th literally think her song she wrote is right now the number one song in the world. Gr Incredible. Greedy by Tate McRae. It, Amy Allen wrote this song with her friends and Tate McRae. And Amy Allen's from Maine. And I went out for a beer with Amy Allen this couple beers, uh, this uh, September or August or something. And she's just so regular and she's so, maybe it's a main thing. She's just remains herself. And it's just so awesome that in the face of the biggest people in the industry, I mean, literally when I'm with her, Justin Timberlake sent her like a mix of a song they made and she's just herself. And I think that is such a skill to be able to have and maintain. So, so shout out to her, but also like that, like, I bet if you met Beyonce or Taylor Swift, they're kind of the same way. They were able to remain and they are sweet and they are nice, you know, and they are kind and they are, and they do treat the, you know, this person the same way they treat that person. And I think that's like kind of a, a lost art. And I think in an age of social media, people can see right through it now because, you know, you're posting all the time and it's like, you know, if you see something that doesn't line up with like who this right. person is supposed to be, it kind of just makes you like turn your head a little bit. I was listening to the new Drake thing on the way down here today. And he was talking about, he, he always will call out women or like call, he'll call people, yeah. but he's always calling out chicks on their Insta, on their Instagram captions. It's like the caption says this, but really I know it's this, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's actually and funny. that's why Drake's great. Yeah. The observations. Dude, well, I'm curious if you have a moment in your career that was just like almost like a very like winning moment, something that felt so rewarding in maybe more recent years that you're just like, you're just very thankful and grateful to be where you're at. I think for me, annually, I do this show, Pete Ank Christmas, which is my record label, Pete Ank. And I do a, you know, the show's not very Christmassy, but it's around Christmas. <laughs> so, uh, and I do it in Maine and it's almost like a pilgrimage. Like people come from all over the country to come to this show. It's like my, um, you know, OVO fest or something, you know, and everybody, they fly from Arizona and Michigan and it's, I got it coming up in a couple of weeks and people already told me they're flying from Michigan and they're flying from Florida you know, and it's like a pilgrimage and they come. And, um, I remember last year I was on stage and there's this part of, um, my song, good luck with your life where Dave gutter, who's plays guitar in my band, he's like an idol of mine, but he's in my band. He sings this part at the end. It's like, can you show me the way back where I'm supposed to go? And I was just letting Dave sing it. And I'm looking around at all the people. Like again, almost one of those moments where you step out of the moment and you just like soak it in. And I'm looking at them all singing along with Dave. And it's like, you know, downstairs, balcony, downstairs, upstairs, balcony. And I'm like looking at all the people. And I was like, this is crazy. Like, this is crazy, especially coming out of the pandemic where I really, we really haven't been in front of people so much. So like that first year was crazy. Um, and so those moments are big, but you know, one other kind of wild thing I learned is that like those big results moments are hard to attain. Those are not easily accessible. Like I maybe can't have one today. So I've learned, you know, and they, this is like a cliche quote, but they're like, appreciate the process. I don't know if I can appreciate the process so much as I do appreciate, um, the people you get to do it with, mm. you know? So like, if I was just like, you know, cause you can change the bar to like, we're going to do this podcast and we're going to put it out. It's going to do these numbers, going to get this content for us. It's going to help us do this. But in a way it's cool that we're just hanging out, yeah, you know? Dude. And it's like, so it's, it's to say like, Oh, you can have the joy right now. You know, and so like, I think the pandemic kind of taught me a lot about that. Cause I was so alone for most of it, you know, besides my family. And, um, the first time I got together with the band to rehearse for like a, we were doing like an outdoor show and I got together with the band and I just left band practice. So happy. Like, ah, we just got to play music together and we got to, and like, we sound good. And it's like making your own joy in a way, you know, and even just last week I made this song blanket 
the people will hear this song at some point. And I made this song blanket and I made a demo of it all myself and I played everything on it and I bounced it to an MP3 and I was driving and I put it on on the Bluetooth in the car and I'm listening to it. And I was just like, yes, you know, just like so stoked. And I was like, oh, again, I made my own joy. It's not anyone else's outside perception of it. It's not how it did. It's not how, how many streams it had, what number suppose song it is in the Spotify rankings. It was literally, I made it. I listened to it. It made me happy. And dude, that's the best thing that you can have the best feeling because, you know, looking at the numbers and like, if you become very analytic, it can take away from that joy and, you know, right. And, you know, ruin a song that you once loved, but if you just love it for what you created and everything, like that's when you're going to be the happiest in your life and create the best quality products in your eyes, probably. Right. And again, if you're not trying to please anyone else, it's pure, you know? And so if you, you know, for the most part, if you're making music, you probably listen to music, you have your own taste, please yourself. And then, you know, if it also pleases other people, bonus. I find that the people that will, that support you will end up liking that stuff anyways, because they see how much joy it brings you and they want to be a part of that. I am thankful that my fans have stuck with me through some adventurous musical, you know, stuff that in some of it's not for everyone. It's like, there's certain people who really gravitate towards like, I have this like straight up like punk rock song called self-help that is a blistering pace, like, anth you know, punk anthem. And that's not for everybody. You know, and then I've got, you know, straight up bar, people like my straight up bars stuff, you know, with no chorus. It's just lyrics and they recite the, you know, they memorize that. And so there's all different stuff, but it's like, I think as long as you keep having fun with it and keep trying new shit, you know, usually as long as it's authentic, they're going to stick with you. If you're trying to be every trend that's out, that's probably not going to resonate, you know, but you can take inspiration from the trend and do your see own what thing. you make, see what you make. Yeah. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to talk to like a younger self, like the kid that was like at the newspaper, oh, wow. you know, how, what would you say to him? Because from that point to now, it's like, you've had not only a full career, but like you've lived a lot too. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't know that what I would tell that kid would be anything about my music career. I think what I'd tell him is that he's enough, you know, I know it's kind of deep, but like, um, I always felt like an imposter. You know, I always felt like I wasn't good enough. And I, if, like, if I became a successful musician, maybe then I'd be good enough. If I, if I work at the newspaper and no one else does, and I'm this child prodigy, then I'm good enough. But actually I was good enough as I was. Right. And so I never really have felt that much in my life. It's always been like, if I can pull this off and prove I'm better than everyone, then I'll be, then I'll be worth it. Then I'll be good enough. And so I would just want to let him know that like, yo, you, as you are right now are good enough and you don't need the validation of this person, that person, this girl, this crowd, this whatever to be a worthwhile, you know, dude, this little dude. Um, and I've been going through a lot of, a lot of like life stuff with my, like my childhood stuff and like trauma and just like, understanding how I became the way I am and why I need so much external validation. And I would just love to relieve that kid of some of that. Cause I think a lot of my life was just the search for validation, even like, and then, but then, you know, obviously I've achieved this stuff where I've got a lot of external validation, but then once you get a certain amount, it's never enough. You need more. You need more and more and more. And so there's no way to ever get enough because you're not validating yourself, you know? And so I would just love to give him some fucking validation and free him from like this desperate quest for everyone else's acceptance and everyone else's, you know, praise because, um, you know, it, the, the only one who can like love you, uh, forever is yourself. Basically. I think a lot of people listening are going to resonate with that. And one thing I want to ask you is how did you find that self-validation? Still searching for it, man. It's, it's honestly like, um, it's a, it's a big quest. And honestly, I've been working on this album kind of about all this because it's like a big life, 
lesson that I didn't learn till I started, you know, kind of analyzing myself and doing therapy and like, um, figuring out why I am the way I am. And, and, um, you know, I always thought my childhood kind of made me tough, but I think most people who think their childhood made them tough, it actually kind of fucked you up, you know, and, and altered the ways that you need, give, receive love, like the validation you need. And so, um, I think figuring that out, has been a journey and, and, uh, it's a constant battle to be honest, to, to validate myself and to give myself the love. Um, and this is going to sound fucking crazy, but I've been literally, if I start going off the rails, kind of thinking about, Oh, this thing or this person or this, whatever, I will literally look in the mirror and tell me I love me. No, I think that's I know a- maybe that's crazy, but like in the car mirror even, or like where the bathroom mirror. Well, you know, I think that just goes into like, you, it, it's like a thing of just telling yourself in the first place. Like if you tell yourself you're, you're never going to do something, you'll never do it. You know, if you tell yourself you love right. yourself, you'll love yourself. So you got to like need to tell yourself these things because otherwise you psych yourself out. You're right, man. You know, what's funny is, um, another thing I've learned is that your thought, I saw this on TikTok. Some some woman on TikTok, where's where I get all my psychoanalytics. Uh, she was like, "Your thoughts are your life experience. It's not the things you did or any of it. It's what you thought about it. Because you could do that. You could do all these things, but your thoughts are." really the story you tell yourself and your brain can't tell the difference between some self-conscious lie and the truth. It doesn't know. And so if you always look in the mirror and you point out your flaws to yourself, that's what you believe. And so I've really been trying to like be better about it, you know, and, and have my, uh, a lesson I've, a way I try to remember it now is I'd like to talk to myself in my head with the same amount of respect and kindness that I would talk to somebody I really like. Mm. Like, would I say that shit to you? No, 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 you wouldn't. And so, you know, and so that's been like a big reality that I never realized is that like, I've internalized all these negative thoughts about myself my whole life. And so to deprogram them is a journey. It's not like overnight you tell yourself you love you, then you love you. It's, you know, and so that's like, um, you know, I kind of been trying to make this album kind of about this whole process about, you know, learning to love yourself and it's not a pretty process, man. It's not, it's in, so it's like, um, especially in, you know, I think maybe I was going to say like social media world, but I'm sure it existed pre-social media. Just the, the, you, you, into, one person says one negative thing about you to you anywhere in your life. And you probably remember it forever. You know, and you, you, you almost can't hear all the positive stuff and like you only remember the negative comment on the YouTube video or like whatever. And so it's really a process to, to tell yourself kindnesses and to tell yourself, you know, that you're good enough and you're loved and you're like, you know, and so fortunately some people don't have to do that and shout out to them. And I think my music maybe was like this superhero costume I put on to be like Spose's on, Spose's, you know, and he's the king of Maine. He's, you know, uh, here's some bar, here's seven albums about it, you know? And, and, you know, on my last album, Get Rich or Die Ryan, I did start kind of breaking down that like, okay, well, what do you do when the superhero isn't getting high off it anymore? You know, like, and, and so I, I have been, it's, it's been, it's been a journey, man. And I think I was avoiding dealing with it for a long time. But I think for me, Um, I literally keep a picture of like five-year-old me in the car, in the SUV where my, like, there's like three, you know, it's like three meters. There's like the, this, there's like the one that's like the revolutions per minute or whatever. I don't look at that. So I got it covering that, you know, with a picture of like five-year-old me. Cause I'll talk to him. Cause when I'm, when I start talking negative to myself, that's who I'm talking to. That's who you're talking to, you know, and I got kids and I'd really like them to like be spared that need for everyone else's validation. And, and, you know, obviously part of that comes from our parents and, you know, childhood stuff. So, yeah. Are you proud of everything that you've accomplished though? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm proud. Yeah, I am. I am. I and and, and um, I'm proud. I'm proud when I take a step back and look at like you know not only the albums but even just my paintings of the last couple of years. It's like, yes, I'm very proud of that. But the struggle is, could I be good enough if I didn't? Is you know is like the 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 battle right now is like, yeah, I'm proud of all that, but I should feel good about myself even if I never made all these albums, never had a gold single, never learned to paint, never you know. You know, I, but I, there are things I pride myself on and it's like being a good dad and like following through when I say I'm going to make an album, I made an album and then I made another album and then I got signed to a deal and I made another album and then I, you know, and, and I, I'm going to make a album in a day. I'm going to make a fucking mobile app. I'm going to make a children's book. And so I'm proud of all that. I'm proud I did all that, but I think all of that was to prove something, Mm. you know? It was to prove something that really, I, you know, I'm, I'm figuring out no one else could give me. You know, there's no amount of validation anybody could give me that's going to last more than a couple days or a week. You yeah. Know? So it's like you got to give it to yourself in a way. Yeah, no, that really makes a lot of sense to me. So it's like it's less about the music and more just your personal, just like, am I content with who I am? Yeah, because the music... You know what, man? If I die tomorrow, those songs are peop- some people's favorite songs, and they're gonna fucking listen to them forever. And they'll always be. There's songs that can get them hype. There's songs that make them have gratitude. There's songs that maybe make them think. There's you know there's uh, songs that just make them stoked. And, and so I've I've done my service. You know, like I've done that, and I and that's dope. And I really feel like I raised my kids. Um, the best I I could without, you know, kind of doing some trauma that I had to them. And so I think that's good. That's all good. I'm cool with my status, you know, my, my time on earth. However, I think, um, I, I would, um, I still got like, I, I gotta, I'd love to feel how I feel when I accomplish one of those things without needing to accomplish it. Does that make any sense? It does make a lot of sense, dude. It's like crazy, but I'd love to be able to feel like what I feel the day an album, like we all got lost comes out. I'd love to feel that without needing that. But I don't know if that's crazy. Is that crazy? That, that could be insane. I don't know if even that's possible, but, um, I think a lot of that is gratitude and self love and positive, you know, self talk. And, and I think, also just being a public figure who everybody can criticize and, and talk about and judge and like, and, and await stuff for and like, and comment, I think has contributed to myself. You know, it's I, not I, a normal thing. Most people no, don't have that. Right. And so it's this whole additional thing that I got to take in and like, you know, I'm like addicted to pulling down on Instagram Mm. you know, to refresh it and see, Oh, a couple more people liked it. You know, I haven't touched Instagram in like an hour since we've been in here. Can you imagine all the love, you know, it's like, (laughs) it's like, uh, you know, it's a wild thing that I'm addicted to in a way because I've been given this serotonin so much of even checking my Instagram messages, Yeah, you know, and stuff like that. And like, um, you know, it's, those are, that's external validation, man. It's not, it's not a sustainable reality. So this is something I, 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 I've been working on a lot this year. Yeah. And do you find with a lot of your more recent records, like being vulnerable has, you know, how has that felt? Yeah. I I remember the first time I ever, I read this book called perennial sellers by Ryan holiday and it kind of changed my whole perspective on, uh, writing songs because it was about how you know, certain things like Led Zeppelin or Adele or the Wizard of Oz or Star Wars work forever for like these five or six reasons, you know, and one of them is being, com- being completely emotionally vulnerable because the purest art is going to come from those moments. And so now it's almost like I'm almost meta about it where when I realize I'm going through a really emotional moment, I'm like, I should write a song, (laughs) you know? And so, uh, starting with going home, which was on, we all got lost, which you shot the video for. Yeah, dude. Starting with going home. Was that our first video together? That was our first video together too. And 
I love the idea. We should talk about that right after let's, this. Let's yeah. please, yeah. And so Going Home was the first song I made after I had this revelation that like, oh, maybe I don't need to like split the difference between like I have emotions and I'm the fucking man and just try to make all these songs that are right in the middle. I can go down here. I can be vulnerable. I can be hurt. I can be depressed. I can be fuck this shit. I'm going home in the middle of the city, but I'm all alone, you know, and, and that stuff people really resonate with and really relate to. And so ever since then, I've been way more vulnerable and open and it simultaneously has been this, you know, really introspective couple years of my life where I've, you know, realized that, oh, the purest version of me is like 10 year old me. You know, and so Get Rich or Die Ryan was like a journey to back to him. Like, what would he want? What would he want the Spose album to sound like? Can it be the Smashing Pumpkins and Jay-Z? Can it be Weezer, you know, and, and Eminem, you know, whatever. And so that, you know, I, I think I did, you know. And so uh, being more vulnerable has even opened me up musically is what I'm trying to say there. But uh, it's become therapeutic for me that like, I'll just dump it. I'll dump the rawest emotion ever into music. Things I things I don't I'm gonna be honest, man. This album I'm about to go out, put out, I am scared. I am scared to put this album out because it is brutally honest. It is the rawest. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say some shit this like to this level of honesty. And it's, it's like, I'm almost like, I was almost like crying one take on this shit and I had to recut it, you know, probably could have left that one in for the extra, you know, whatever yeah. extra bonus. But, um, you know, I, I, it, it, um, it really makes you feel it when you hear it though. Yeah. You can't not. You know it's real. You can't make that feeling up, dude. You'll just, it's a vibe, dude. Whether it's good, bad, or anything, like, you could just feel it, and you could tell, like I said, you could see some, see through something if it's not authentic. Right. And you could do that even if it's not, like, big emotional stuff, but this is big emotional shit, and so this is, like, the rawest shit I've ever done, and I hope to, in a way, man, I hope to be only more vulnerable as time goes on and more open because I think that's, like, the realest shit, and that's the point. That's the whole point of the art is that someone else can hear it and they're like, oh, that's what I was feeling. Or, oh, you know, even like the story I told you about the elevator dude, it's like, oh, Spose is human. You know, it just makes you feel like, oh, I'm not alone in a way. You know, these like emotions that feel really lonely, you know, and really alone. And so this, you know, the, the being vulnerable in the music has almost opened me up to last another 10 years, you know, whereas if I was just trying to be like, I'm the king of Maine, you're a bitch of Maine, you know, like for, for whatever, for another decade, that shit's, that shit wears out. That's not, I can't fake that. Yeah. Even if I felt like that. And, and sometimes I do feel like that, but I will say there's even this one, the intro to the album, cause the album's like a movie where I start off as this naive character, shit hits the fan. I learn a lot about myself and eventually maybe arrive at self-love. Um, even the intro to the album, which I recorded maybe a year and a half ago, I tried to recut it. I tried to recut the vocal because it's like my timing was a little off and like I didn't like the way I said this one word. And I tried to recut it and I tried and I tried and I tried. Couldn't and get I tried. the emotion. I couldn't get the emotion, man. I couldn't be that person. Because you know, probably when you cut that, you were more in it and now trying to like recreate that motion a year and a half later, you're almost better off just leaving the raw. I'm like an actor yeah. trying to do like a based on real life events, like scene or something. Cause that kid who said that, you know, me, I was 36 or something. Yeah. That dude really meant it, yeah. you know? And it's like, it's, it's something to be said for like the take that you keep. Cause it's so real and you can't, you could get it perfect timing wise, like whatever, but there's just something you can't fake about really feeling something. I want to take this to the end zone, dude. And I want to talk about where we started creatively. I want to talk Fuck about, yeah. let's talk about going home, dude. Yeah, going man. I home. think we met up cause I saw a Chris Webby video you did on a pirate ship. Insane, dude. And that I was video like, was hilarious. And it was like directed by Mike Squires. And I was like, who's, I followed you. 
Yeah. You, were, you had a check mark. <laughs> Let's go, dude. I was like, this guy's a big deal. And um, yeah, the first video we ever did was going home. And I think I, I had had the idea that it, it's a little version of me. You came with me with the idea and you had like this a drawing, fo- a Photoshop, like of all these heads floating, like a wall, like it might've been you walking or a reference or it might've been the Beatles walking or something. Yeah. I forget. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty hands on Yeah, and I'll, you know, like, for example, I'm doing a beer with this brewery, um, Bissell Brothers, I guess I could just say. I'm doing a beer with Bissell Brothers. Congratulations, Thank dude. you. I'm very stoked. And they've been friends of mine for years. And and uh, their creative director, this girl, Lucy, was just congrat- was just thanking me because she goes, I've never done a collab with somebody who sent me the whole Photoshop file finished of the of the label. That's true professionalism. Yeah, dude. I was like, can I get the template? <laughs> you know, and so it would be, a, it would only be right that when we started, I sent you a, a reference image at least. I try to, I try to take it all the ball almost to the end zone myself, and then put people I I I think I understand what they do in a position to succeed. You know. Yeah, and the heads in that music video kind of almost represent everything we've been talking about, dude. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. So yeah, it's like a kid. If you go watch the video, maybe we could put a clip of it in here somewhere, but it's a kid with like his mom and dad and coach, you know, and somebody else's teacher's heads all floating over him. All the, ju- all the voices in your head. Um, uh, skele- I could hear skeletons dancing in my helmet or whatever the lyrics are. And so, um, yeah, man, that was a great experience making that video. And it was the first of many. We did a few more yeah. um, over the years. And um, you Mountain did a great top, job with that. Mountain doors. Top, yeah. Suicide Doors. Shout out Sydney. Sydney, yeah. Superstar. Amazing, dude. Well, I think that's it for how much time we got today. All right, man. But is there anything that you want to plug or talk about? No, just follow me on, uh, you know, at Spizzy Spose on all the socials or follow my Spose art on Instagram, you know, and that'll keep you abreast of all the spose shit I got going on. Could people commission you for a painting? No. That's a beautiful thing, dude. No, because people have tried. And I, and I did one. I did it for a, a friend of mine I love. Like one of my biggest musical collaborators, Goddamn Chan, who's a gr- this incredible producer. And he was like, yo, would you paint my album cover? And I was like, yeah, man, for you, yes. Give me some beats in exchange. And I get one day into doing this and I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore, (laughs) you know? And so with painting, I've tried to keep it super pure where it's like, if I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. Doing it it for you, dude. Yeah, I'm doing it for me. And I don't want to ever be sitting at this easel feeling like I don't really want to be doing this. So I finished Chans. I ended up having fun. It was a challenge. It was a tough one. It was a marijuana plant, which is... 70 different shades of green and purple. It was very difficult to do and gray purple and like fucking that was hard, but I crushed it in the end and it was a big challenge, but yeah, commission paintings. Fuck. No, I will <laughs> never do them. All good. Dude. I hope to never, unless like Kanye hits me up or like, um, you know, maybe, um, Jason Tatum or something yeah. like I'm, I'm good. No, that's a beautiful thing, dude. But I super appreciate you coming on the pod, dude. It's been Thanks a great for having time. me, man. It's been a pleasure. Squires. Let's go, dude. Sp- Squard war. <laughs> Spizzy Spose. I want to share with you guys my thought of the day. And that thought is this. You are good enough and you can make anything you set your mind to happen. You just need to commit and be consistent. And I'm not saying that's going to be easy. It's going to take some hard work. But if you put in that hard work and jump into the pool like we were saying, it will pay off. You just need to be consistent. And like I always say, you just got to believe in yourself before the world does.